Good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry to interrupt some stimulating conversations, I'm sure. Uh, but I know that our guest is going to uh, stimulate that many more. Uh, and uh, just let me say that uh, I'm Milan Verveer, and I am so pleased to be here at the Wilson Center with Gwen Young and um, to welcome the NATO Secretary General Special Representative, um, Claire Hutchinson. Like so many, I can't tell you how pleased I was personally uh, when Claire was appointed to this important position early this year. She is no stranger to gender and security issues. She's a Canadian citizen, served as a gender advisor for the UN for many years, including serving in Kosovo and Lebanon. For those of you who may not know about this position, it was created in 2012. Claire was preceded as special ambassador, uh, special representative, by a very committed Norwegian diplomat who went on to be her country's uh, ambassador to Afghanistan. And she was followed by an preceded, she, the Norwegian diplomat, was followed by a Swedish diplomat who also brought de great dedication to the post. Uh, it was a privilege for me to work with both of them, and today to see the progress uh, that NATO continues to make, and I might add, accelerate under our guest of honor today. NATO's top leadership also, uh, both the Secretary General and the Deputy Secretary General, uh, and Rose Gottmahler is the Deputy Secretary General of NATO. Uh, she's an American citizen, and she is the first female ever to hold that role in NATO. Uh, and she and, and the, the leader, the Secretary General, both understand the critical importance of mainstreaming a gender perspective uh, across all of NATO's operations. So there's a strong team at NATO uh, in the leadership on these issues that we're going to discuss today. And NATO has increasingly taken the UN's imperative established in Security Council Resolution 1325, which I think since you're all here, you know, uh, links the role of women to peace and security. They have understood that and taken that leadership uh, in a serious way, understanding the importance of women's participation for operational effectiveness in peace and security. And in the military venue, particularly, the whole issue of operational effectiveness uh, is, is very paramount uh, uh, in ensuring why the integration matters. Although the first NATO general representative, gender representative, was not named until 2012, NATO recognized the importance of 1325 back in 2007 and named the first field gender advisor in 2010. However, I, I personally believe that progress on this agenda uh, has only accelerated in recent years at NATO and we're hopeful that that acceleration uh, will continue at the pace uh, that it is currently going forward. As those of you know who follow this issue, the two key pillars in 1325 are on the one hand, protection, preventing and responding to sexual and gender-based violence and conflict, and on the other hand, participation of women in decision-making in peace building. In NATO, this includes the role of women in the armed forces, it means focusing on training, operations, the promotion of women at all levels. It represents women's participation in crisis management and cooperative security. It encompasses the pre-deployment training of soldiers, the assignment of gender advisors, the monitoring and reporting of conflict-related sexual and gender-based violence by NATO commanders. So there's a whole lot here. Uh, that Claire will be touching on, I'm sure, and that you will be interested in, in talking to her about further. 
For example, NATO has supported women's efforts to respond to the conflict in eastern Ukraine. Ukraine is the only country to have adopted a national action plan on women, peace, and security in the midst of a war. Uh, women have experienced high levels of gender-based violence, including sexual violence in the conflict. Women have been active in their armed forces and even as volunteers uh, in military action, but have not had the kind of opportunity and support they deserve. And that is also true of their role in decision-making more generally. That is all changing in the process of their implementation of the National Action Plan. And NATO has sponsored workshops to support women's efforts to address those shortcomings and challenges. And I know what this means because I've been there myself and heard how important it is when you do these kinds of convenings there. In Afghanistan, NATO through ISAF has long been aware of the importance of women's contribution to security and any potential for sustainable peace. It saw the need for women among NATO troops and established a structure of gender focal points to support the efforts of gender advisors. We had in those days uh, when ISAF was, was dominating the situation uh, in terms of addressing the problems in Afghanistan. FETS, the female engagement teams uh, in Afghanistan, which demonstrated the need for women among the armed forces in terms of the kinds of work they were able to do. And today, as part of the successor NATO-led mission, Resolute Support, NATO has furthered training, advice, assistance, et cetera, for Afghan security forces, including women in the national police and family response units that are dealing with violence, including domestic violence, as well as the female members of the female tactical unit within the Afghan special forces. NATO has a national action plan, and they have been updating that plan regularly. And I must say, they had a plan before the United States had a plan. Um, and that plan continues to inform uh, their actions in this space. I remember going to NATO back in 2012 when I was in government to brief on the U.S. National Action Plan, and many of the, of the member states at the time had questions. First thing was to say, we have a National Action Plan, but we need help in implementing that plan. And I know that kind of work goes on today uh, at NATO, and particularly under Claire's leadership. A quick review of the 2016 NATO NAP report shows significant progress by NATO members uh, over the previous years in addressing key issues. Now, I'll just hit a couple of these. For example, 41% of NATO member nations have introduced new policies or legislation re related to integrating a gender perspective in their armed forces. 96% have opened all military positions to women. 81% have provided training programs related to prevention of sexual ha harassment. And 74% have trained gender advisors. I could go on, but you get the drift. These are very important steps in the right direction, and they re represent progress over previous years. So I look forward, as you do, to Claire's remarks, um, not just on NAP and how the member states are doing and implementing it, uh, but the range of issues uh, related to women, peace and security, and the integration of this agenda in the overall operations of NATO. So thank you, Claire, for coming and for doing this here at the Wilson Center, and I leave it to you and Gwen to carry on. Well, good afternoon all. Um, it's lovely to see some familiar faces and to meet new friends. Always delighted to meet friends. And I want to thank you for the invitation to be here. Um, this is certainly a place where I, um, I have watched and learned from as well. So I am delighted to be able to be among great supporters of this agenda. On October 31st, 2000, as you know, Security Council of the UN unanimously adopted Resolution 1325 on women's 
it was, and remains so, a historic leap forward where women would no longer be described as helpless victims, but instead finally be recognized on the political agenda as active agents of peace and security. Its essence is about making the invisible visible. It's about opening spaces and dis dislodging obstacles to women's participation in the decisions in and around conflict and peace. It was a groundbreaking resolution because it changed the shape and narrative of conflict to reflect a broader thinking, a more nuanced approach to peace and security. We know that sustainable peace cannot be achieved without women's security and equality. We know that the treatment of women in any society is a barometer where we can protect other forms of oppression. And we know that countries where women are empowered are vastly more secure. We measure the rise in violence so the decrease in women's rights and shrinking space for women's rights. Since the adoption of 1325, seven sister resolutions were adopted, which collectively make up the Women, Peace and Security Agenda. And these provide the blueprint for the enhanced protection of women who are most vulnerable in conflict and their aftermath, but equally important, lay the foundation for the participation of women in peace. They collectively reinforce the global understanding and adapt of security through a gender lens. The adoption of the resolutions has led a shift in the understanding that there needs to be a better balanced approach between horizontal and vertical approaches to security. Today's global threats are complex and multifaceted. Terrorism, transnational crime, drug trafficking, cyber threats, hybrid warfare, climate change, mass migration. They've all complicated the security environment in unprecedented ways. While the primary responsibility for ensuring implementation of these resolutions rests with nations, NATO, as a military and political alliance, has significant contributions to make. For NATO, the adoption of the 1325 resolution represented a significant political shift, recognizing that women's experiences and roles in conflict are vastly underrepresented, but increasingly important. So as mentioned in 2007, NATO adopted, developed its first policy and action plan on women, peace and security, which provides the operational framework to implement the resolution at different levels of the alliance structure. This policy and complementary action plan for women, peace and security is in the process of being revised and in time for the NATO summit flag. The new po policy reaffirms our commitment to protection, participation, prevention, as well as the inclusion of gender perspectives in all our functions. It's aligned with the International Women, Peace and Security Framework and underscores the core functions of the Alliance. And we are guided by three new guidance. One, integration. Recognizing that gender equality must be recognized an integral part of NATO policies, programs, and projects, guided by effective gender mainstreaming practices. Two, inclusiveness, where NATO must seek to increase the participation of women, women at all levels, in all tasks across NATO. And three, integrity, which is absolutely essential in a women where we aim to address systematic inequality to ensure fair and equal treatment of women across the alliance, but also address sexual exploitation abuse on the ground and to protect women. But we're also thinking more broadly about the connective tissue between security and stability and protective environment. My office, as you may know, connects the dots between the different elements. I also, the children in armed conflict, protection of civilians, human trafficking, and cultural property protection. So we have an enormous, enormous mandate, very small office. But together, we are trying to bring the defense and security dialogue, which are seemingly to be the peripheral issues, but not. They are and must be at the core of the way we do our business. We have a more structured focus to addressing the issue of sexual violence in conflict. NATO has developed military guidelines to prevent and respond to conflict-related and sexual gender-based violence. Is that good? Thank you. 
Do I have to repeat everything? <laughs> so these guidelines serve as a practical tool for commanders to address and respond effectively, as, as we already mentioned. We have a lot we've done, but we can do so much, and we intend to. We know that when gender becomes an integral part of our thinking, business will change, and the way we do business will change. Going forward for our policy, our tension over the next few months and years will be on increasing participation of women in nature addressing the gender balance and promotion of women in decision-making and leadership. We must get more women into leadership positions around the world. We must do better of having women have strong voices and articulate those voices at the table. But we must do more to get young women at the table because women need to be there. We need to empower them. We need to hold firm to our commitments on women, peace and security to say that if women's voices aren't present, we're failing. We must do more, and we will do more, on the issue of prevention response to conflict related to sexual violence. And that means the inclusion of gender in prevention mechanisms, including early warning on detection, also early warning on countering violent extremism and cyber and hybrid threats. The issue of early warning is the where we need to be focused on the prevention aspect. And we are looking at how do you detect, and I know this personally from the academic work I did, uh, when I was working towards the work of my PhD on early warning gender analysis, watching how states can move into conflict by the way women are treated. And we can see the increase in small arms and domestic violence. We see the rhetoric around women's bodies changing, the rhetoric around women's political rights changing. You see the, the lack of women's economic opportunities. And these are all the signs and indicators of a pre-conflict condition. We have to do more to bring this into the space where we work. We also need to do better of integrating gender perspectives, and we need to do more about addressing what is a gender perspective. Because quite often we fall back on the issue of, oh, we're mainstreaming, and then nobody knows. So how do we do that? How do we give the tools to make sure that we are integrating across all the work we're doing? But importantly, more importantly, we need to more, work more closely with our friends, international organizations, and we need to work more closely with civil society. Implementing gender equality and women, peace and security cannot be achieved alone. Facing emerging and constantly evolving threats means there has to be robust collaboration, robust partnership to address robust, robust challenges. It's essential we work together on this. Too often, gender equality and women's rights fall victim to political expediency. So we must stand firm on issues that move collectively the issue forward. We need to engage women more in the dialogue around defense and security. Women are best placed to speak to the issues of participation and protection, and we must do more to bring their voices into our work. Without women, processes actually lack legitimacy, and I've seen this on the ground with the work we've done. Exclusion of women undermines the chances of achieving sustainable it's for this reason we established the Civil Society Advisory Panel, some of you may have heard of, which is, which is being constructed to produce a more open and inclusive dialogue with women around defense and security. I am very personally interested and invested in hearing what women have to say about defense and security. We need to understand that 50% of the population do have a concern and do have a role to teach we know we have an obligation to turn our words into action. And I know that leadership is essential if we are to overcome these challenges. And we're very lucky to have a very strong and committed leadership in nature. Because ultimately, in the end, it's about change. And change is different, but change will come. And we have to understand that gender mainstreaming is not the end in itself. It is the strategy to deliver better on the mandate that we have. And we must deliver better on the mandate for the sake of women, peace and security. Thank you. That is on. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Claire and Milan. I'm Gwen Young, for those of you who don't know, and I run the Women in Public Service Project 
And we have a very simple goal of ensuring that by 2050, women hold 50% of leadership positions in governments and places like NATO worldwide. So we have a goal that's very, very much aligned. And, um, and I'd like to ask a, you know, a few questions more about this leadership, because you did bring it up. And some of the stats that, that we pulled up in looking at today were that in the NATO countries, women comprise only about 13.8% of heads of government. Um, but they're 27.6% of ministers of defense, so we're doing a little better in, in that range. And then they're really down into the, the teens and below the teens as a participation in the military. I'd, I'd like to you know, probe you a little bit more about this women's leadership, sort of the, having the, the negotiators, having the ministers of defense around the table, but also the importance of participation in the military as well. Thank you. Um, I mean, we know that leadership generally is I I critical to advancing the agenda. But what I also want to say that having women at the table is important, but it's only important if those women are feminist women. Because we can have women at the table who are not advancing the agenda or not advancing women's rights, um, but what difference does that make? Because we need to make sure that the collective thinking around uh, where women should be situated politically, where women should be situated economically, is something that's a collective responsibility. And so having women who are pushing the agenda to help other women is very important. I think um, it's, it's a dangerous if we just count numbers for the sake of numbers because we end up with just numbers. Um, and so at a leadership level, I, I have personally seen in NATO, so NATO, of course, is, is quite a, more of a male-dominated environment, but we have some incredible and phenomenal and strong and just really a, just fantastic women ambassadors who I have seen how they together have made a change or been able to move some of the agendas on, across NATO uh, forward. Um, they are role models to the other women, to the younger women in the organization. So I've seen personally how that works. Um, getting women into the political sphere is something that we have to do if we want to make change in the right ways. And we have to do it so that it has meaning. And that, again, we're not just going back to them. Now, in, in connection to the military, um, it is important for us to get women into the military. It is important for us to get military, women in the military to do one thing uh, I think is important to role model. And although I'm not in the military, uh, when I was in Darfur, I worked in Darfur for a while, and women in Darfur would come to me and ask me to teach them to drive because they would say, I've seen you driving and I want to do that, so please teach me. And so the idea for me that you can empower, and sometimes you don't know how you're empowering women, simply by being bold and fearless and being out there and doing what is right, you can be empowering people without even knowing it. And so these women in Darfur were asking to be taught to drive. I think this is why we need to also We need to have more women to set the tone, to set the pace, and get more women into spaces that are often closed off. And I want to dovetail from that, from you know, one of the reasons you know, there's the role modeling and then the more women in the military is presumably also more information about what's actually going on on the ground, sort of as you're proceeding through peace, and talk a little bit about how you're integrating these voices. You've got the civil society groups. Presumably, you get some more women in the military. What are, what are the tools we're using to make sure that I, I've worked in conflict situations, and what I see often, and we were talking about this before you come in, is that during periods of conflict, it's women who lead the communities. Right, so how are we ensuring that we're taking into that perspective of what's going on at a community level into um, peace and security discussions? Well, um, and as you know, when NATO had a mandate to ISIS, there was a lot of work done with engaged women in the community. Our mandate there has changed. But it was where, that's where we learned the value of increasing um, For two reasons. One, that a check, where women were, were going through check and contraband or whatever, they had no one to to check and talk to them. Um, and then, oh, again, then engaging with the community um, about, on a situation awareness issue. And so uh, for NATO, we're looking at, at an operation. So through our operation, how do we drill down and get, get the information we need to make it do our job better. But also by making sure it's across all of the functions of support task um, at a policy <coughs> level as well. And one of the re ways we do is to ask so recently, we, we asked our uh, civil society advisors to give guidance on small arms like weapons guidance. 
um, and we are going to then plan to do more of this about what does this work look like to women. Um, one other area we're trying to do is now reach out to women and ask them what, what do they see the fence looking like. Because quite often we forget they need to have a voice in And so we're going to reach to the supply, ask now in our nation, to our allies, what does the fence look like? What should we be doing to integrate work? Um, so using the to help us to do better work. Uh, that's really important. Which leads me into a little bit about sort of the, the military guidelines to respond to sexual and gender-based violence. Can you just talk, talk a little bit more about what that there's integrated into early warning? Are there some more sort of practical steps you're doing in either training militaries? You've talked a little bit about national action plans and maybe integrating that into that. Can you talk a little bit more about some of this insistence? So um, the, the guidelines that we've developed are for the military because this is where they need to be at the operational level. Um, and right now we are looking at how do we transfer them into a guidance, into actually a handbook. Because it's great to have policies, but as you know, policies do not translate to action. And so we're very cognizant of that. And so we need to be giving the direction on what to do. What do you do if you're faced with the issue of conflict-related sexual violence? If we don't make clear, and this is with all the policies, if we don't make clear what we want, then often people get confused, our troops get confused, and then they stand back. So what we need to do is do the handbook, which we're in the yep. process of doing, and then we're going to develop the training. But there's a lot of good work already done by the UN and the EU and the OSC out there. So we're going to build on what is already working and adapt to the nation. Um, it's, this is the process we'll do with all our policies. We're going to develop the policy, develop the guide to the policy, the action plan, and then develop the training. Um, we have to recognize that one of the biggest impediments to women's empowerment is violence. And that is something we have to address in the NATO context, in our operation. And that presumably, as you said, is building on sort of what other organizations are doing, but also what other organizations on the ground are doing. As you're talking about, you know, there's legal ramifications and support systems and psychosocial support. Um, what, um, want to talk, okay, so you brought it up. Um, gender mainstreaming versus integration. <laughs> what, how, do you, how would you like to define gender integration? You know, I always give the example of gender mainstream. People always say gender mainstream. And what, and what everyone says is we're, gender, we're mainstreaming gender. It's an easy thing just because they don't know what they're doing. Um, so mainstreaming gender, and I give the example, I'll say, this is an example of gender mainstreaming. When I, uh, there was a, a project in Liberia, and I was working with the UN at and they went into a, a village, and they asked the village, what is it you need? And the village asked, they said they needed the road asphalt to get to the, um, to get to the market. And there's a, a project called the Simic Project, where you give sort of light money, <coughs> seed money, to little projects. So they said they'd do that. So they asphalted the road, and the road was never used. So the gender team went back to the village, and they asked, what is it with the road? And they went to the women. And the women said, well, if you'd asked us, we would have asked for a well. Because we don't actually have any water, clean water. And the only reason we need the road is to go to market to sell the produce. And we have no produce because we have no water. And that was a simple way of just saying, have you asked women what is important to them in their lives equally to men? That's all gender mainstreaming is. It's not rocket science. But we fail consistently in an international way to do this. So that is mainstream. Integration is the same thing. It's integrating it. Now my difference would be integration is more into policy, mainstreaming is applying the policy. So you're mainstreaming from the integration. So you're integrating it across all of the work that you do, but the actual application of the integration is the mainstream. Which goes a little bit to your sort of linking participation of women to actually also driving agendas and policy making in a different way, but the same. Parallel. Um, want to talk about a little bit, and it's probably not particularly fair, but these sort of numbers in the, the military, because the women numbers are so low, and yet on the flip side, as you said, 96% of the positions are open to women. There is, I think, gender assistance, you said, in about 84% of, of the militaries. 
Um, and this is an area we'd like to look closer in as well. But what what is your thinking on that? Is it the role modeling? Is it the 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 safety? What do you, what do you think you know needs to be done? Well, I'm not military, but um, and um, we have consistently around the world lower numbers of women. Um, and getting to understand why we have those lower numbers is something that we are taking on board because. We should not be developing policy if we don't know the reasons why we're developing policy. And I, I'm, I'm really quite want to be clear on that as we do the work because we need to be asking women in the military what are the challenges, what are the uh, structural opportunities. Now it, could, it comes down when I worked in peacekeeping, there were many reasons. One was structural, one was uh, you know deployment, one was um, the time, the six months to be deployed, and and. But we need to do better at gathering all of that evidence to see how do we then address it. One thing we don't do is change standards. And one thing we should do always do is recognize that women who are service women are, are soldiers or officers, same as their male colleagues. And I believe quite firmly women can do anything men can do. And I think that goes to the military, to the police, or to any other sector. What we have to do is start changing internationally the mindset around is this a man's role, is this a woman's role? And we need to firmly put in place why it's important to also have these spaces open for women as well. Because it's not, it's not about having women in the military, it's about having militaries do their effective work in the application of their duty. And that is where we have to move the narrative because um, I think we're, we're not, there's something that we're not doing right, but we need to figure out what it is and get more women, if women want to be in the military. They, they, also, want to they may not want to be in the military, they may not want to. Um, so we also have to unpack all of this and put it on the table and figure out. One thing I, I, I don't like is, 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 is where we will carry a message that women should be deployed because they speak to um, survivors of sexual yeah. violence better, because I think they should be deployed to do the job as they are qualified to do. Absolutely. And so I think we have to be careful as well about that goes to sort of the role of women, which Ken discusses with operational effectiveness. Um, one sort of last sort of double-pronged question is just sort of this notion of inclusive security, because arguably this falls under this, and it's the run-up to the summit. Where does this play in NATO and in and the summit? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yep. So um, as, as I mentioned, my office, uh, so I'm the special representative of the Secretary General, but we also have an office that is an inclusive security office of all of the different issues. And so in some areas, I mentioned we have um, cultural property protection. Um, I'm very interested in, in, in what happens to when you start destroying the fabric of society, what happens when you start destroying cultural identity. You're just buying into further conflict, right? You have nothing to build post. And we know that um, the responses we have in conflict have to be military responses, but they have to be broad too. And this is where the security is in. How do we do the issue of stabilizing? How do we then address? And we know one of the indicators of um, is there more, is there stabilization, say, in uh, Afghanistan, is the number of gardens that have been grown. We know that when women start planting, they're saying that they're more safe. They're saying there's safe space. So we know this uh, is evidence out there. Um, what we need to do is bring the inclusive security dialogue into the security dialogue. Absolutely. And really be at the center of the work we do because it's not a mantra, and it's not one that should be outside of the main framework. Because otherwise, we're only addressing half of the problem. Uh, we need a robust, and 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 these are really complex, challenging times in terms of how do we address conflict on the ground? How do we make sure that it's not just adding women, during, no. but it's adding a whole inclusive approach to how we how we respond. How you look at it, how you define it, and how you respond to it. And this is an unfair question, but we walked in on this, so I want to, uh, can we talk about climate security a little bit? Want to give us your thoughts? We can. Just a little bit. <laughs> but but I think uh, often, you know, it, it's come up in the Pentagon, you know, I would say relatively recently in terms of the days I went into humanitarian relief, which is where I work. But uh, we were talking on the way in, and, and this goes to the definition of security, right, and the definition of where these threats are coming. And we were, you were talking about Northern Mali. And the fact that these women are often the ones, I don't want to say suffering because that's the wrong word, but having to deal with the consequences of climate 
And I'd love to give you a few words on that. Well, as you know, NATO doesn't deal. This is outside yeah. of our mandate, absolutely. And, and so um, when we look at, uh, at emerging issues around the world, what's interesting, when I was in, uh, again, working for United Nations Peacekeeping and I worked in southern Lebanon, I asked women, as I constantly do, what matters, what is important to you? And I asked them, what does security mean? And women often said, clean water. Um, a clean environment, um, those areas where I can feel safe, a house. Um, they talk about the more human aspect of that they feel safe in those spaces, which is very different. And so looking at the issues that are now becoming, and the UN's addressing this head on in terms of um, emerging security issues and climate change being one of them, we need to understand what makes population safe altogether. And right now, we're only looking at one half of that population. Um, the issue of change in any, in any, be it environmental or be it political or whatever, it affects women. We need to broaden out the construct of how we look at those, those security um, dialogues. And we need to also bring women's understanding more clearly into what that means. Now, I know that hasn't addressed your question directly, but it, it is something that we need to... Um, we need to unpack a little bit more uh, the global, international issues. It's interesting because it leads me with moderator's prerogative a little bit to, to, to talk a little bit about, we've talked today about sort of women leaders in NATO, women heads of state, women in the military. But under the, the NATO Women, Peace and Security Agenda, there's also sort of women in science and technology. And so maybe a couple comments on, this isn't just sort of women on the front lines in the military, but there's quite a variety of roles women can play in addressing peace and security issues. I mean, getting more women into STEM is essential. Right? And we also know that women, even if you study STEM, um, there's only about 60% of them stay in engineering or STEM-related uh, careers. Um, we need to get more women into, into work of, of, of cyber defense. Um, not only is it there's a, a, a gap in terms of the workforce, um, but also to have that gender perspective onto um, how, how we are looking at the issue of cyber. We also need to get women into the, the research on, on different aspects. Security is so broad. Um, and this is where we need to be pushing some of that conversation, as well as women, about we need to be in these spaces. And I, I, I feel that if we're not, um, we're not present, we're, we're left out economically, but we're left out advancing some of the ways as we think through policy and advancing policy. When I started out my career, I started in an, an engineering company of uh, about 100 men or whatever. Um, and it was, uh, maybe that was the beginning of my interest in, in having, uh, fighting for women's rights. I mean, simply having a toilet on the same floor uh, was, was just not, you know, was not there. So, so we need to get more women into to open the space so that they change the way we're thinking about, um, about these issues. I used to work on, uh, in when the internet first came out many years ago in the 92 as a topic, I used to work um, as a researcher looking at how women and men use technology, very nascent technology. And it's very interesting because collectively what happens with technology, um, or did happen, was then it, whenever there was a, a, a technical glitch, women would say, I did something wrong. And men would go, there's something wrong with me. And so, we, from the very beginning. From the very beginning. And I don't think that changed much, much more over the years. But this is why we need to have these gender perspectives, because then how do you, how do you write language? There used to be a, um, a, an error on a computer used to say you'd made a fatal error. You used remember to that? Use the I word remember fatal. Fatal, yeah. fatal error <laughs> in that. Microsoft. And I remember writing a letter of complaint. <laughs> I don't think it went anywhere. Um, to say this is terrible language, because it becomes internalized, and then it turns, it was turning women away from, from doing anything with technology. We need to have a better gender perspective on all of this othering um, areas, because unless we do, we're, we're not going to make the space open, we're not going to get more, we're not going to encourage more women to be part of this, this process, and, and we're going to be left out of an economic space we need to be in. So I think there's a lot more work to do in that area on both but also on the other parts, like the, the, um, the STEM and cyber. 
cybersecurity. So that leaves us perfect timing to open it up to the audience for some questions because we have a whole sort of swath of things to talk about from protection to security to participation. Uh, we'll start in the front with Chantal and we'll kind of move back. I think, Chantal, there's a mic coming up. Um, the front here. Thank you very much. My name is Chantal Jung Artad. I'm the president of Women in International Security, also known as WISE. And I think we have a chapter in NATO as well. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about your uh, priorities. You have a huge agenda. Uh, and it's almost an impossible job. But I want to ask you about your priorities for the WPS agenda, both your short-term priorities, and particularly in connection with the summit, what would you like to see in the communique that comes out at the end of the summit? And then maybe broader uh, your priorities for NATO uh, in terms of the WPS agenda. Is it about gender as a capability? Is it about personnel, et cetera? Thank you, thank you. Yes, so um, as we lead up to the summit, we now have, uh, we've revised our policy and we have the supplementary action plan that we are hoping will be adopted at the summit. Because as you know, this is the driver towards how we can move things forward. Um, the priorities, um, and then we have an inclusive security side event where you know, we would like to profile the collective work of inclusive security together. Uh, we want to do more in showing and demonstrating why they all work together. Why is children on conflict under my mandate? Well, first of all, it says it's the opening, opening of 1325 links to the protection of civilians and children on conflict mandate. And I believe that each of these mandates stand firmly alone, but there is an interconnectedness and an interoperability between them that we have to address, otherwise we're stovepipe. And if we stovepipe, we're not going to have traction on how we do security as, as we do in NATO. The priorities for women peace and security, first it's leadership and getting, you know, and I have the commitment from the Secretary General, who believe me, I'm not just saying it because my boss, but he is one of the most incredible uh, thinkers and leaders on women, peace, and security. Comes with a, a personal part in this, in this agenda. And then, of course, we have the DSG. But also to making sure everybody at the leadership level gets it. So we're looking at, through our action plan, to develop leadership coaching and mentoring. That's, one of, that's where you start. But then you also have to drill down to all of the others. Now, as you'll know, we are resource light, is the word I would use. A bit like a Coke Zero, that's what we are. Um, and so we need to get more resources in, generally, um, to be able to, to forward this, uh, this agenda. But because we don't necessarily have those resources, we have to rely on you, you know, the force multiplying factors, we'd say, through the, the, the gender focal points. So we have a robust network of gender focal points. I want to give them great training. I want to develop a real a course over six months that's going to bring in experts to really help us define um, what are the essential elements for women, peace, and security. Uh, we cannot move this agenda forward if it just relies on me and my team. It has to be everybody's responsibility, from leadership all the way down. So ultimately, I want to see that women, peace, and security is situated in every part of NATO's work, from defense investment all the way through. So we have eight divisions, it has, an, it has a connection to everything. There is a women, peace, and security element in everything we do. Um, in some it's a little lighter, in some it's more, but I want to make sure that we get that dialogue and we make sure we're main, mainstreaming, but with effect, not mainstream, but, but just for the sake of it. And then the last part is measurement and evaluation. We cannot do great work if we're not measuring it. We cannot advance if we don't measure. And we cannot understand where we are unless we evaluate what we have and where we've been. And so for us as the new, um, as the new process, over the next year, we're going to be doing, um, trying to develop a good, really effective measurement m and &E system. We've never had one, so it's quite ambitious. And it's going to be linked to everything we do. So everything will have some kind of a focus on, can we make change? And if we can't, we're going to leave it out because it has to be driven by, uh, we have to be bid driven by evidence-based research. We have to be based, uh, the work we do has to be based on, does it make sense and does it bring change? Because ultimately, we're going to be like hamsters in a wheel, just going around circles. Um, 
it's not where we need to be. And we need to, I think it generally in the international community, we may have plateaued a little bit on this issue. And we have to get the next curve. Right? And I spoke about this this morning. We have to stop doing the anniversary spikes. Right? So we suddenly become very interested on International Women's Day. We become very interested on the anniversary of 30 and 25. And then the rest of the time we forget. So we need to not forget but make priority the issue of women's security. So the, the monitoring evaluation, the leadership and the commitment and coaching, these will be the priority to drive it forward. And, um, and I think if we can get that, we can really harness the change that we want to make, hopefully. I love the mini part of that because I think the, the, the actionable, not just the metrics for metrics sake, but they're actually going to drive them that people can grab onto and your performance internally and your commitments internally can be measured. I'm going to stay off my... High horse on m and &E. I've got a friend in the audience who I'm sure would love to join us. Um, do we have some other questions? Yes. And yeah, please identify yourself um, before you start your question. Hi, Sarah Williamson with Protect the People. Great to see you. My question is about NATO operations and if you could address uh, how your office is liaising with women in places like Afghanistan and Ukraine and, and how you see that cooperation moving forward. Yeah, thank you, and good to see you. Um, it's, so, as you know, we have two active operations uh, in Kosovo and Afghanistan, and we have gender advisors who are deployed um, to, those, uh, to those missions. And one of the jobs of the gender advisors is to reach out to civil society to make sure they're integrating um, their, the voices into, into the work that we do at that level. But we also, on our civil society advisory panel, have women from those areas. Um, and they are giving us the insight to what it, we should do at the operational space. Now, unfortunately, you know, um, the mandate of, of, of NATO in Afghanistan has changed. So it's sort of a lighter, um, slimmer mandate where we do the capacity building um, instead of reaching out now. So what we need to do is make sure we get the women's voices into the curricula of how we uh, develop this. And what we're also doing is developing gender analysis methodology. And so we'll be using civil society to help guide us on the development of gender analysis tool, which we are hoping to use um, in other missions, for example, like Iraq or um, other missions that we, or work we would do in operation space. Uh, we have to get the gender analysis right, because this is the building tool, and the gender analysis has to be informed by those on the ground who know better. And this has always been from when I was in peacekeeping to now, the people who know best are those who are on the ground. It, we have to rely on the knowledge of women who are in these places where they're at, or those who have built their own protection or prevention or participation mechanism. So we're going to build more on civil society, rely more on civil society to give us this insight. But make sure civil society is also in places where we need to be. So we need to have them in Kosovo. We, need to, we have them in Kosovo and Iraq. Um, but we are also going to be expanding our civil society advisory make sure that those voices are getting more into the work to do at the operation, on the operation. Absolutely. I think we have time for one or two more questions. I thought I saw some hands in the back. There's one right over here. <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get you a mic so that you can be heard on the webcast. <laughs> I'm wondering, you said you have more women in NATO, and do you find any um, empathy uh, they are and children are so often. I, you know, we need to have more women in all of the work that we do generally because women are fifty percent of our populations. They have to be represented, and I think what we have to understand is women, like men, come from many different viewpoints. Um, not all women are in one part of the world singing songs of peace, right? We, we have to accept that. And not all men are perpetrators of violence. So what we need to do is bring in the nuanced understanding of what, what women bring. And I believe women should be in a space simply because they have a right to be there and that they have a right. Now, their opinion may not be the one we necessarily want or like, but their opinion matters because they're women and they should have an opinion. And I think this is where we need to be going um, as we move forward. But we also have to be very... Uh, we have to be very careful about when we say women are all representing of one woman. So the idea that a woman from Norway is not going to speak 
on behalf of a woman from um, from Kenya. You know, we and this is sometimes what we do when we say women need to be at the table yep. because we think women's going to speak on one voice. So we have to do a bit more of the intersectionality as well. How are we going to get more women in who are representing more broadly diversity? How are we going to get more women in who are going to speak across the board on different issues that may not be all singing from the same songbook? And so that is what I want to do. Um, are women all, all, do women all have empathy? I don't know. I, I, I would question that. <laughs> um, and all women are not necessarily all peace loving. Uh, as I say, we don't all, all hold hands and sing kumbaya. But I think it's important to have women, no matter what their opinion, because they need to have the opinion heard. And that is what we need to do in ACO, is to bring the stronger voices to the table. We need to bring the voices that aren't being heard to the table. But we also need to reflect the better part of society. 50% of our populations plus are women. They should be in all parts of the work we do. Um, so with that, we're not speaking on their behalf. They're speaking on their behalf. And this is what we say in the women's leadership space is we want more women leaders there because you want the women, not because particularly there's a particular leadership style and not all women lead the same, but we want them there to be at around all the decision-making tables, offering their perspective and hopefully offering the, the best policy solutions that we can, we can muster when you have the other half of the population sitting at the table. And I think that we've all been inspired today by a woman leader a woman leader in arguably a difficult space, both the women, peace, and security space, but through an organization like NATO that works in a place um, wh where I sit, we have an index of where women sit globally. And where we lack the most data and the most understanding is in the security sector for a variety of reasons. So it's, it's wonderful today to hear about what is going on within NATO, what's going on within NATO militaries, the commitment, the notion of inclusive security, and, and getting us ready to watch what's going to happen at the summit coming up in a couple of weeks. So we are honored to have you here. I would like to thank you. Thank you for coming to the Wilson Center. And on behalf of all of you, thank you for attending our discussion today. Thank you.